Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Thunderbird uh, Adventist Church. And uh, we hope you had and trust you had a great week. If not, well, this is a good time to start all over again, wouldn't you agree? And so forth. Before we have our announcements this morning, though, we have a little tradition around here that after you just get settled, we ask you to get back up and so forth. And we do it for a good purpose because we want you to shake hands with that person next to you. Of course, Jim is saying, well, that's my wife. But that's okay. That counts too and so forth. But anyway, once you get up and uh, say hello to everyone, welcome them for being here today, okay? Just a couple of announcements this morning. Um, I know that um, when we have a downtime, which we normally don't have in the worship service, uh, for you to take a look at your bulletin, but it does make for nice Sabbath afternoon reading and so forth. But just a couple things. Thunderbird of Adventist Academy has the International Food Festival tonight at 645, right? There we go. So if you like different types of food, that's a good place to go. And uh, since I'm doing the cooking at home, since my wife has a foot issue, uh, we're more than happy to go tonight and get some good food and so forth. But we'd like to invite you to come and support the Academy and meet friends there and have a good evening of fellowship. Uh, also, you know, we're going to have a church directory online. How refreshing is that? You know, the problem with the directory, a paper directory is, what's the problem with a paper directory? No, it's not lack of paper. Let's just try another one. It's obsolete a week after it comes out, right? And so forth. So we're going to have an online directory. Now, from your perspective, if we don't have the right information, then it will be obsolete when it comes out. So we want you, if you notice in the bulletin, to call Dee Dee and give her the correct information. Address has changed, whatever. Phone numbers changed, that type of thing. Make sure that you get a hold of us so our directory is up to date. So, boy, hey, George, I think we're supposed to, uh, uh, are they going to put pictures in that, do you know? Uh, you can upload a picture. We prefer, if you're 75, we prefer not your high school picture. Something that's a little closer to what you look like now would might be good, okay? All right, let's start our worship service. Thank you for coming. We appreciate that. I love this first song that we're going to sing today. Um, it just reminds us of all the things that God is for us. He's our strength. He's our shelter. He sustains us. He is everything for us, everything that we need. Please stand with us as we sing our opening song.
Father in heaven, we give thanks that we can come before the throne of grace today, that we can be in this place, that we might again worship you for the many things that you have done for us. We thank you for Jesus. We pray for the Holy Spirit's presence so we might gain a real blessing today. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. I don't know why, but I was waiting for the children's story, and they have children's church today. I knew that very well. <laughs> uh, today's offering is not for the local church budget. Today's offering is for religious liberty. Um, if you open your bulletins, you will have found our uh, campaign information here. Uh, in, I encourage you to flip over to the back little fold here with the envelope on it, and you'll see that you can uh, receive a full year of Liberty Magazine with a $6 donation. That $6 donation goes towards the sponsorship of the magazine as well as supports the Religious Liberty Department for the North American Division. They are also um, funded through other means in the general fund of the North American Division, but Liberty Magazine and the department receive a special offering once a year um, on Liberty Sabbath. Uh, I think Liberty Magazine probably is thinking maybe protecting the wall was not a good slogan for this year. We hear a lot of wall talk today, and it's all politically charged. And out of this climate that we have right now in Washington, you see extremes. We see the, the talking heads and, the, and the, uh, uh, the news media talking uh, about issues that are ranging from totalitarianism to total socialistic views. And in both of those extremes, there has always been, every government that has been socialistic or totalitarian has had infringements on religious liberty. It doesn't seem like our political leaders right now want to maintain a status quo. They want change. They want change in some way. And I'm finding that um, the more of the left that I hear and the more of the extreme right I hear, the less I like. Liberty Magazine is our watchdog on religious freedom, li religious liberty issues in the United States as well as worldwide. Um, there are excellent articles in Religious Liberty magazine. It brings forth issues that have to deal with Sabbath work, but it also brings issues to the forefront of other countries where we have genocide and religious um, oppression uh, in Africa and in other areas of the world as well. I have a very short video that I'm going to play and then we will have our um, prayer. And, but this is a message from uh, Mr. Steed, the uh, editor of Liberty Magazine. Of late there's been a lot of talk that the separation of church and state, which Thomas Jefferson declared was essential to maintaining the First Amendment, there's been talk that that is no longer operative. How could that be? Great Baptist pioneers, particularly in the United States, like uh, uh, Isaac Backus, John Leland, and Roger Williams, 
defended it and proclaimed it so widely that it became integral to long-standing thought on religious freedom. I'd like you to hear an interview with Holly Holman from the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Freedom and see her perspectives, which essentially is our perspective on religious freedom and the United States and how it's relevant today. Separation is not just a constitutional concept, but it's a religious concept. Actually, the first person who articulated the idea of separation between church and state was Roger Williams, the founder of Rhode Island and the First Baptist Church in America, who talked about the hedge or wall of separation between the garden of the church and the wilderness of the world. You know, with a lack of historical understanding or careful thinking about religious liberty, and there's so much information coming at us, I think it's easy to fall from myths that denigrate separation of church and state. Uh, Roger Williams and others could speak about separation based upon their view of the Bible. The idea of separation you can see in biblical passages. From the very beginning of the Hebrew Bible, we know that the Creator God created human beings in God's image, free in matters of faith, to follow God or not. Religious people look to Scripture and their understanding of God and their relationship to God. And the idea of separation is sort of built into our understanding of God. We were created free in matters of faith to follow God or not. And so when the government respects the separation, we believe that's government respecting God's creation. The idea of separation can also be found in the idea that we are citizens of two kingdoms. We see that in the New Testament scriptures about rendering unto God what is God and to Caesar what is Caesar's. Jesus called people to follow him and trusted that people had that free will and would follow in love, not using the course of powers of government or force. It's really important for religious people to speak up and continue to support religious liberty because we know it comes out of our religious heritage. Baptists and Adventists have long been known for their support for religious liberty. The publication and dissemination of Liberty Magazine is one way that we can continue to promote religious liberty and thought about our religious heritage, our religious liberty heritage, and the challenges that we face today. So we come to that same moment that we present every year. The challenge is clear. What we're doing is clear in defending you in the workplace, presenting religious liberty through Liberty Magazine, and witnessing to those in power. And our response, your response, my response, is to be part of this great endeavor. Thank you in advance for what you can do monetarily and with your prayers and support for what we need to do in this time to defend religious liberty and indeed the wall of separation. As your religious liberty ambassador for this church, um, we are sending Liberty Magazine to uh, one of the public libraries close to the church, to the League of Women's Voters, um, to the commanders of Luke and Davis Monthan Air Force Base. Um, and if you have a suggestion of where we could best send a subscription, we're also sending a, a subscription to Thunderbird Adventist Academy as well. Um, I would like to know about it. If you would just let me know in some way. Uh, our our uh, deadline for turning in our paperwork for the subscriptions are the first weekend in March, I believe, the first week of March. So if you have any ideas or you want to send it to yourself, fill one of these out and make your uh, donation today. Also, if you are doing your online um, uh, offerings, there is a button in World uh, North American Division uh, for Liberty Magazine. You can just go to that area do a search for liberty and it pops right up and you add it and it's right there for you know, when you go back to your uh, cart, so to speak. Okay, will the deacons please come forward? Yes, Dad. How many members of our church are receiving liberty? 
We have 22 subscriptions, so there are some, uh, probably 15 members that are receiving because of the others that we are sending out to other places. And we have some that will be dropping off to 22 total, um, but some will be dropping off on this campaign. So we have room for many more. Please fill out your application. <laughs> Let's bow our heads. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that we live in a free country where we have the freedom to worship you. We pray that you will continue to bless this country, that you will bless the efforts of Liberty Magazine and the Religious Liberty Department of the North American Division. We pray that you keep us Keep us with open minds so that we can see the workings of the evil one in this world and we will not be deceived when the time comes for us to flee from our homes and, uh, and see firsthand the evils that will come at the end time. We ask that you bless all the offerings, the general fund for our church and for our conference and our tithes as well. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. you free. And Jesus says, who the Son sets free is free indeed. So I, um, I invite you guys to stand and join us in saying who you say I am.
Yeah. 
See if this works for you. I came in if you know what song I was singing because you know they didn't want to sing the same song or play the same song. And this is one I wrote, so it's a pretty good chance that it wouldn't happen. Um, this is a difficult song to play. I must have been. I don't know what I was thinking, but uh, it fits because it's a difficult song. I, I want to explain the song a little bit. Um, you got to find, uh, see where my heart was. This is written during part of the darkest hours of my life. Um, I had been betrayed by me or lost close to me. My first girlfriend had been killed in a car accident, and everybody else in my life had deep betrayals. And I became very angry with God. I never stopped believing in God. I just, I hated Him. But God kept reaching out to me and, and telling me that I needed to learn to forgive. And I said, fine, if you want me to forgive, let's see how you forgive. And um, God loves a challenge. So I read about how God treated Judas, how Jesus treated Judas. 
And it broke my heart, and I saw God in a different way. I didn't see him as the harsh judge that's just waiting for us to mess up. I started to see him as a God of love. And then I started to read about how Christ cried at different instances. There's two different words for wept. You know, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. And that just hit me. Jesus has emotions. Not only does he look at our emotions and count our tears, uh, Psalm 56, 8 says that he saves our tears on a bottle. But not only that, but he weeps. And there's two different words. The one in um, where Jesus wept is jakru, or dakru. And that means a soft sobbing. It's like you're not speaking, you're not, doing anything verbal. It's just tears coming down your cheek. But then I read how he wept over Jerusalem, and that's uh, Clairu. Clairio? Those who are Greek students, uh, please forgive me. <laughs> but that's a loud wailing. It's the same word used when Peter ran away after he'd denied Jesus three times. And that's how Jesus cried over those who had rejected him. And that just broke my heart that Jesus feels emotion deeper than we can ever imagine for those that reject him. Teaching in the, oh, sorry. Teaching in the courtyard in Jerusalem Gold from her for temple reflecting the sun. It was a beautiful scene that would fill an Israelite with pride. But there were tears in Jesus' eyes. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would have given you under my wings.
You'll take your Bibles with me and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. You know, a uh, pastor once told me, he said, Chuck, and I was a new first elder at the time. I was 25 years old. He said, I want you to try something. Uh, he said, if I do it, I might get into trouble, so I'd like to ask you to do it, and so forth. So I said, Okay. Uh, and so forth. So he said, I want you to read a different text than what's in the bulletin. And I want to find out how many people object. And there was about 160 people in the congregation. After we were finished, two people came up to me and said, I think you read the wrong text. Now we smile at that, but I will tell you something. Is that and we come to worship service, it is always a good idea to make sure whoever's speaking is quoting the right text and so forth. So there is a lesson there somewhere and so forth. So if you'll take your Bibles with me, a good introduction for that, and turn to chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. I'll be reading out of the New International Version, and it says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. George. Extend a warm welcome to our all our visitors as well. Mute. Oh, am I mute? Can you hear me? No. Oh, okay. It's the wrong one. <laughs> All right. This week, um, I uh, celebrated my 20,440th day on this earth. Um, I, I kind of said it that way, so you have to do the math, but... One thing that I have learned over that period of time is that the next 365 days, you know, are going to be some good things, and then there's also going to be some trials and, and difficult things that will come. And over my 16,060th days of being a Christian, I have learned one thing, and I can testify to you this morning, that God is good all the time. And the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ has become the most beautiful thing to me. I am blessed because I know that as we sang today, I am loved, I am chosen, and I am a son of God. And those are powerful things to be able to take hold of, to have that knowledge. And that's what keep, the gospel keeps me going. And I hope that it keeps you going as well. So as I was thinking this morning what I was going to talk to you about, 
I started looking, and I want us to look at the theme of a good soldier. The theme of a good soldier is uh, one of the items that we are going to talk about today. And the Bible uses this illustration of a soldier in warfare, in battles, in a race, in a fight. It uses that because it wants to teach us some spiritual truths that will help shape our Christian experience. And those are the things I want to explore with you this morning. So let us bow our heads and let's have a word of prayer. Our Father, our, our God, holy and worthy are you, Lord, to receive our praise and our worship this morning. We invite, Father, your presence to be with us here this morning. Please come, Lord Jesus, through your Holy Spirit. Fill every heart that is here. Fill us with your peace. Give us your knowledge, Lord. Help us open our minds. Lord, I am nothing, um, but Lord, you can use me. And so I just pray that you would take my lips, use my words, uh, that I might be an instrument in your hands. Lord, pray that you would speak through me and to me. And may Jesus be uplifted in everything I say today. And Lord, uh, we just acknowledge you as our creator and redeemer, our captain and our guide in um, spiritual warfare that we deal with every day. And so, Father, we just pray that uh, you would give us the peace and assurance this morning uh, of your love and your grace is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Webster defines a good soldier as someone who uh, joins the army. The qualifications of a good soldier, according to the U.S. government, is one that includes reliability, fearlessness, discipline, consistency, courage, motivation, and skill. Good soldiers must be prepared to exceed their abilities, be diligent in getting tasks completed, and stay focused on safety. I know that in, our, in this congregation we're blessed because we have um, members and people, and also we have sons and daughters that have served in the U.S. military. Um, and I know I have with me today a friend who came, uh, Kevin Tierney, a good friend of mine. He served in the U.S. Navy for 22 years, and I'm glad that Kevin is here, and he came because I told him that uh, when he came to church um, that I was going to be preaching. Uh, and so he said, well, if you preach, I'll, I'll come. So I'm glad that Kevin is here. Uh, I'm delighted for that. So I hope to uh, do you proud today. Um, it is undeniable that as Christians, we live in a battlefield. A war that started in heaven, but the battle happens here. We are in the front lines of the war. And Paul uses the metaphor of a soldier to teach us some spiritual truths as he was relaying to Timothy. And these are the last words that Paul relates to Timothy. He, Paul is at the end of his life, and as Chuck read for us in 2 Timothy 4, 7, verse 8, he's telling the young minister to be strong, but he's kind of giving him a synopsis, and he says, as Paul had been a good soldier, said, you know what, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award for me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who love his appearing. This morning, as we will be looking at this, is going to be Paul's message to Timothy. In 2 Timothy Chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to them. And we're going to read, starting in verse 3 and 4. And we're going to read, it says, You therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. There are going to be five qualities that make up a good soldier, according to Paul. And we're going to break those down this morning. In the military, not everyone who joins the Marines gets to be a Marine. They go through a very arduous process. And Paul tells Timothy here, you were chosen. 
You were chosen. The last part of verse 4 says, You were chosen to be a soldier. The word chosen is like well, how we use that we are called. Called to service. So the first quality of a good soldier is to answer the call. If you are called, will you answer the call? There is nothing more dishonorable than a man who puts on a uniform and when the time of battle comes, he turns around and doesn't want to go to war. You are considered a coward in the military if you did that. You have dishonored yourself and the code. What is your response this morning to the call of being a soldier? Would you answer the call? In 1914, Sir Edward Ernest Shackleton uh, was getting ready for his Imperial Trans Antarctic Expedition. And he put this ad uh, in the paper. Now it's debated in some whether he actually did it or not. But the ad goes like this Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. Quite an advertisement, right? But many did answer the call. But not all of them were selected. Only a few were selected. But men wanted to, to join in, into this cause. They wanted to live life on the edge. I remember the uh, advertisement of the Marines, and I think it's still, it's the few, right? It's not for everyone. It's the few, the proud, the Marines. That is the mindset. The mindset is it's of a few. So Jesus gives us this, this call to be a good soldier. He is calling us, and the question in this morning is, how will we answer the call? In Luke chapter 9, verse 57 through 58, uh, one of uh, Jesus' uh, followers came to him. And Jesus answered him, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the airs have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, you say you want to follow me, but I don't even have a place to rest my head. Animals will fare far better than you if you, uh, if you follow me. We must answer the call. We have been chosen by Jesus and the question is, again, the call for discipleship, how will we answer that call? You are called to be a soldier of Christ. In the Christian realm, many have laid down their lives for the Word of God. Many saints went and hid in caves and, and wrote down under candlelight uh, the Bible. Many individuals were burnt at the stake because of the Word of God. Really? <laughs> it's belated birthday now. <laughs> but Christ, Christ's word is so, was so precious that many gave their lives for it. One of the other things that um, the verse says is that you therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, to endure hardness. That is another uh, quality of a good soldier, is that if you're a good soldier, you will endure hardness. There is a, uh, a documentary that uh, I saw about Army Rangers and what they have to go through. So for eight weeks uh, process, it's very stressful. Um, they go and... Uh, they were doing this documentary, and out of 300 uh, men who wanted to be Rangers, only 90 kind of went through and finished the last round. It was physically exhausting. They go through it. None of them went in thinking it was going to be an easy task. They had to endure hardness as a soldier. And there's a story told of early Christians meeting uh, in uh, Rome during the early Roman uh, Empire. There were 40 men 
who were worshiping. They were worshiping uh, in a house secretly. And a centurion found out that they were worshiping, so they gathered them, soldiers gathered them and took them down, and they said, what should we do with them? And he said, uh, take them down to the river, build a fire on the edge of the river, and then have them take their clothes off and go into the river. So they did that. They took the men who were worshiping Jesus, took them down to the river in the middle of winter, had them stripped of their clothes, go into the river. And the centurion said, there's a fire here. So if you renounce Jesus and accept, Jesus, and accept Caesar as your Lord, then you can come out and warm yourself. So the men shivered into the water. They got close together to just try to keep warm. And one of them started singing, 40 men of Christ are we. Faithful forever we shall be. Forty men of God are we. Faithful forever we shall be. Forty men of God are we. Faithful forever we shall be. And they just kept saying that over and over and over as they shivered there in the water. Then suddenly, one man broke ranks, came out of the water, and he went to the centurion, went before him, and he says, I renounce Jesus, and I accept Caesar. So they brought him a blanket, led him to the fire. Centurion goes out to the men. Anyone else? The men were shocked that this had happened. They were silent. And then one started. Thirty-nine men of God are we. Faithful forever we shall be. Thirty-nine men of God are we, faithful forever we shall be. And they sang for hours, louder and louder, to the point where the governor heard the noise and the ruck, and he came out to see what was going on. He got dressed, went out to the river, talked to the centurion, said, what is, what is going on? So the centurion explains to him what had taken place. It was illegal to worship anyone but Caesar, so here were these Christians that they had found, so they, he explained it to them. So he stood there, watching the men as they shivered in the cold, huddled together. Thirty-nine men of God are we, faithful forever we shall be. Thirty-nine men of God are we, faithful forever we shall be. And they sang and they, for hours doing that. All of a sudden... The governor starts taking off his clothes. And he goes into the water. And as the men are singing, 39 men of God are we, faithful forever we shall be. He tells them, no. 40 men of God are we, faithful forever we shall be. It was what he saw, their faithful endurance, it convinced him to give up Caesar and accept Jesus as Lord. So the second quality of a good soldier is to endure hardness. Life will not be easy. The Christian experience is not easy. The third quality is found in the first part of 2 Timothy 2.4, which says, No man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life. But no man that wars... So in other words... Does it say that we go to war? Yes or no? Do we go to war? Yes. It says no man that wars. He is expecting that you as a soldier of Christ will go to war. That we will be involved in the warfare. But this warfare is not a warfare that we engage in with guns and knives and things of that sort. This is a spiritual warfare. This is a warfare, and this is evangelism. Sharing what we have with Jesus, sharing our experience, that's what it means to be a good soldier. The third quality is that we will be active, in active duty. 
to engage in the battle of saving souls when we are sharing what Christ is doing in us, for us, and around us, when we minister to others, encouraging, uplifting them, engaging with them, caring for them. That's how we grow when we share Jesus. Not only to just keep him, if we keep it just to ourselves, that experience is not one that is one of growth. If we come to church only on Sabbath and we pray only here, I can tell you from experience that that, that will not grow your, your, your Christian experience. You will spiritually die if you do that. If you don't have a daily relationship and a daily walk with Jesus, that you're constantly counting on Him and, and talking with Him and praying with Him, you will die. You will not survive. If you're depending on the quality of the speaker, God have mercy. <laughs> I'm not a very good speaker. If you're relying on the preacher, you're putting your hope in something that's not right. You will spiritually die. Many young people sometimes will say, Where, how come we don't see the miracles? Why don't, how come we don't see you know, the things that we read in the Bible? Why don't we, how come we don't see that? And it's perhaps because we're not engaged in the warfare and in the battle. Because we're not active. I know that many who have done culporting, and I know that those who have culported, when you're active in ministry, you see God working. God does things. And you're not alone. So the third quality of a good soldier is to be active. We go to war to be active. Zechariah 4, 6 says, Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord of, to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And Ephesians 6, 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces, of this darkness against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's what we battle. That's what we war against. War against self. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Second Corinthians 10.4 These are great precious promises that we can hold on to. The fourth quality of a good soldier is that it says, no man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life. To entangle oneself in the affairs of this life. In this life, we have to be involved with the affairs of this life. We have things that we have to do. That's just normal. That's just part of life. But the word says that we should not be entangled. We have you know, school, we have work, we have all these different things. But it says that we should not be entangled or, in, or bound by them. In other words, the things of this life should not so dominate us or bind us that we are consumed with them and that we have no time for God. The things of this world should not bind us so that we don't have time for the things of another world. When a soldier is at war, or he goes out on a mission, I don't think that a soldier would be checking, taking out his phone and checking his Facebook status or whatever, or be texting, right? When you're at war, and you're out in the battle, and you're on the mission, you're focused. Everything is all-consuming, you're just focused on that. When um, I was uh, with Kevin, Kevin and I went camping, uh, uh, last last year in, uh, in November, we went camping. And when we were camping, he shared with me a book uh, from the military that he used to make his soldiers, his you know people that were under him, read. And as I did some research on the book, and I read it, um, and, and as I read it, it's, it's called The Message to Garcia. Um, it is required reading in, in some, uh, still in, in some divisions of the, uh, uh, of the armed forces. How many of you have read that book? Have you ever read 
a message to Garcia? I see any hands? Okay. It was written in 1899. It was an essay by, essay by Albert Hubbard. And in it, it's entitled A Message to Garcia, it expressed the value of individual initiative and conscientiousness in work. As its primary example, the essay used, uh, uses and dramatizes the version of a daring escape performed by an American soldier, First Lieutenant Andrew S. Rowan, just prior to the Spanish-American War. The essay describes Rowan carrying a message from President William McKinley to General Calexico, uh, Calexico Garcia, a leader of the Cub Cuban insurgency, somewhere in the mountain vastness of Cuba. No one knew where. The essay contains Rowan's self-driven effort against the imbecility of the average man, the inability or unwillingness to concentrate on a thing and do it. In the message to Garcia, one of the quotes says this, the point I wish to make is this, McKinley gave Rowan a letter to be delivered to Garcia. Rowan took that letter and did not ask, where is he at? By the eternal, there is a man whose form should be cast in deathless bronze and the statue placed in every college of the land. It is no book learning young men need, nor instruction about this and that, but a stiffening of the vertebrae which will cause them to be loyal to a trust, to act promptly, concentrate their energies, do the thing, carry a message to Garcia. And so the story uh, took on uh, you know, propor proportions. It was duplicated a lot. A lot of people uh, you know, use the story. The, our military still uses it today to inspire men to take initiative. Someone asks you to do something, you do it, right? So he was trying to teach them uh, that initiative. And as I read the story, one of the things that uh, I relate to it is that we have a message to deliver. We also have a message to deliver. Not to Garcia, a general, but a message that is of far more importance, a message to the world. We have been given that message, a message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, of the power he has to save. That is the message that we can carry to the world with singular focus to not to be distracted by the things of this world. If we don't make time to study God's word and if we don't make time to be intentional about sharing God's word, then we won't do it. So the fourth quality was not to be entangled, but to be focused. So here's a picture. I don't think it's historically accurate. I think it's just put on there. But the Spartans, another uh, group that was famous for war. Um, they made a movie, you know, the movie 300, right? Um, uh, that was about Spartans. And Spartans are unique because Spartan society was, they would, from birth, if you were looked at and you were kind of scrawny, uh, you were put out. You would not uh, survive. You were left out to uh, the wild animals. If they thought that you weren't able. Their whole society was based on war and warfare, and they valued it a lot. So much so that mothers would give, uh, give their sons their shields with the words, return with it, or carried on it. In other words, that is to say, be victorious or dead. Since in battle, that heavy shield that the Spartans would, would, would wear would be the first thing the soldier would be tempted to put down and leave behind. But dropping the shield was the synonym for desertion in the field. So they wouldn't do it. Leonidas, the famous king uh, of the city-state of Sparta, when the Persians were coming in 480 BC, it came to the, this battle of uh, Thermopylae, I don't even know how to say it, 
Thermopylae or something like that. So he went to this battle, and when he he was thought that he would funnel them through between these, these two places, and, and so they, they, they stood there. And he had 300, 300 uh, soldiers from Sparta, some Greeks, and some, from some other groups that were there as well. And they blocked off the first advances that were made, but then there was another advance that came around the, the sides, and they weren't able to hold them off. So he knew that he was being outflanked, and so he sent some of them home, and only the Spartans stayed back, 300, to hold them off as long as they could. And there was a, as they were getting ready for battle, there's a story told of a wafer that was passing by, and the stranger, they said, where are you going? He says, I'm going to Sparta. And so it's said that Leonidas looked at him, and he said to the stranger, he goes, go back to when you go back, he says, tell them that we have fought as Spartans, that we have kept the law, that we have been faithful. And the most honorable way to die as a soldier for them was to die on the battlefield, to give their life in service. I don't know, for me, uh, this is an inscription from uh, one of the, uh, an epitaph. It says, Go tell the Spartans, thou that passes by, that here, obedient to their laws, we lie. We know that we are, we'll, there'll be a time of trouble that um, will come. And I don't know what the Lord's plans are for my life, but I would like to think that I would like to be faithful so that I can say, tell Jesus, I have behaved the way he wanted me, wished, it, wished me to behave, and I'm buried here, and I have given my life for his service. I want to be faithful to Jesus. And the fifth part of 2 Timothy 4 it says that he may please him who has chosen him. That he may please him who has chosen him. The final quality of a good soldier is aim is to please Jesus. As Paul is wrapping, putting all this together for him, he says it's all about Jesus. That's the whole reason we do what we do. As a good soldier for Christ, we acknowledge that he has chosen us and we want to please him. The Marines, when they go through their training, the last piece that they do before they become a Marine is they have to first pass what's called the crucible. And the crucible, it's a 40-mile 40, 40 uh, hike, or a couple of days with limited food. So for three days they, they, do, they do this and they have just uh, rations for three MREs for, for three meals. They sleep for only two hours uh, during that period of time. So it's very grueling, challenging them physically, mentally, and even morally. And only those who make it through earn the title to be called Marines. Many break down and cry when they go through that process, when they finally make it through. There's a ritual when they come through and they come in, when they come in, it's the morning, it's dawn by the time they make it back. And there, they're, there's a general and there's a, uh, their uh, sergeant and commanders are there to welcome those who have made it. Those who make it through they get pinned. And for the first time, they are called Marines. So their sergeant will come, place a rank on them, salute them, and say, good morning, Marine. For the first time, they hear those words. Many of these hardened men break down and cry. 
They cry because of their experience that they have gone through. They know how, how difficult it's been. And they have made it. But unlike this, the military example that I'm relaying to you right now, there is a prevailing truth that we hold that is a little bit different. And that is this. 2 Timothy 4.18, Paul con continuing on um, in his letter to Timothy, says, The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to His heavenly kingdom. To Him be glory forever and ever. Amen. We will not be able to stand and take the credit like these soldiers, the Marines do. They do it through willpower and everything else. But for the Christian soldier, it's not like that. For the Christian experience, it's very different. For the Christian experience, it is the Lord who gets the credit. It is the Lord who gets us through it. And that's what Paul is saying here. Revelation 12.10 says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven, saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Christ has come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. The results of the war, the war that we wage are known. Jesus has already won. Our victory is assured. Satan is a defeated foe. We are sons and daughters of God. We need to start believing it, living it. We are free. We are no longer bound by sin. That is the good news of the gospel. And that is where the analogy of the soldier kind of breaks down. There's a story told of a massive elephant who was being held in place by a small stake and a rope that was obviously too small to hold him. A tourist marveled at the fact that the elephant felt trapped and wouldn't go beyond the boundaries. Until the trainer explained to him, he said, I started with the stake when he was a calf, and it held him. He became so used to it that he still thinks it will hold him. He doesn't even try. It is time to try the rope. It has already been broken by the same force that broke the bonds of the death for Jesus. What's holding you back? Are you even not trying? Are we not living our lives in a way that we know that we are sons and daughters of God? Are we being held back because of the lies that Satan says about us? Are we being like the elephant, constrained, used to being in that, in that area? Jesus will one day meet us. At the end of it all, Jesus will meet us. And he will greet every one of us as his soldiers. As he says, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done. I long for those words where Jesus will come and he'll say, John, well done. Well done, my faithful servant. Nick, well done. Well done, my faithful servant. You will reign with me, and he will take a crown and place it on your head and say, good morning, your majesty, because we will be kings with him. What a day that will be. There will be tears as we will recall how He has made it all possible. He chose us. He molded us. He loved us. And we will see and we will remember that we were not faithful. That we let Him down. That the times that we thought we, we weren't tough enough, we fell. But there, Jesus will say otherwise.
Jesus will say, you have been faithful. And you'll know in your mind that you have not been faithful. But Jesus in front of God and the unfallen angels would declare to you that you have been faithful. The reason we are here is because of you, Jesus. Jesus has been the faithful one. And I think they'll say, crown him. Crown him. Crown him. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. He will have the name that is above every other name. So my appeal this morning to you is quite simple. This morning, do you want to be a good soldier for Christ? Do you want to be a good soldier? The qualities of a good soldier. We will endure hardness. But are you willing to endure hardness? Will you answer the call? Are you willing not to be entangled with the things of this world? And finally, do all to serve Jesus who made it all possible. If this is your desire this morning, I just ask that you would stand with me as we pray. Father God, we come before you thanking you for who you say that we are. And Lord, we just want to come and we want to be good soldiers for you. But we acknowledge, Lord, that we are weak and we need your power and your strength. But this morning, Lord, we also rejoice and give glory to your name because you have won the victory. And you have provided the weights for the fortresses and the walls to come down because you have won. And Lord, we just want to hold on to that power and be faithful to you. We pray, Father, that you would be with us, that you would strengthen our decisions to um, follow you, to please you, to answer the call that you have given us to be your servants. Lord, we thank you and pray that you would seal our decisions until you come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, it's time for a family prayer. And after a sermon like that, George, we need prayer. So if you want to come down and join me, you're certainly welcome to do so. If you're comfortable where you are, that's fine as well. Let us deal. Our Father who art in heaven, it is truly a privilege to come to before the throne of grace, sitting in the universe, sitting in the throne room, and we have a booster row seat. We're thankful for that, certainly undeserving, but we're there because you love us, you care for us. Sometimes we just don't assimilate that very well. We pray this morning, we want to give thanks for the many blessings you've given to all of us. We know in a congregation this large, some of us have had maybe a peaceful time for a little while, and others are going through some really difficult things. Sometimes they're unmentionable. And yet, Lord, we pray that sitting here today, as we've heard the message that you've provided for us, that there's always hope, that you always care, you're always concerned, and you will, you will walk with us. We allow you to do so. We're thankful for our salvation that you have given to us. We're thankful to be children of God. Only through Jesus have we had that opportunity to make that claim. We also know that there is a tremendous assault today on our nation and on our church. And because of it, we have doubt, we have perplexity, we have anxiety, and a lack of hope. We pray today that we might be a light in a dark place, that we can share with others that with Jesus, hope is not only possible, it is a reality. That yes, as Christians, we have anxiety. As Christians, we have hardship. But Jesus has taken the weakest, 
and made them strong. We pray today that that blessing of hope is upon each one here today, that they walk out of this place knowing you just a little bit better. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. song today is called Leave Me to the Chaos. Uh, it's about remembering the exquisite love that Jesus had for us when he sacrificed himself on the cross for us. But my favorite part of the song is a line that says, Lead me to your heart, which talks about being led to the very heart of God. Um, yesterday, Pastor Eddie Turner came and he shared with us at the school um, about the love of God the Father and what it exactly it took for him to allow Jesus to sacrifice Jesus for us and how much that shows that God the Father is in love with us. So please stand as we sing our closing song and think about being led to the very heart of God, which is full of love for you and for me.
Yes, lead us, Lord Jesus, to the heart of God. Help us to trust you each and every day to come to the foot of the cross and lay our burdens down. Help us to have that desire to daily want to commune with you, to daily entrust our lives to you. Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit. We know that it's not by human strength, but it's by your Spirit only. So, Father, we just pray that you would pour out your Spirit on everyone here today, all the families represented. We ask a blessing, Lord, so that we might draw closer and closer to you, that we might further the work of your kingdom, that we might be good soldiers for Jesus because of what he has done for us. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for the gifts and the victory we have in Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.